Boom. You guys know what time it is. We live in the light here on the Power Smith Thieves Water Review stream, and we're starting off with LCS action. It is, in fact, 100 Thieves versus Cloud9. That's going to be our LCS review of the week, and I'm excited because finally we get to review 100 Thieves. Now, I'm not going to go straight into the YouTube link, and I do like to linger with the light mode here so that people in chat lose their minds before I go, but... Given we got quite a lot of things to talk about today, I'll spare you guys the light mode for now. We'll have a little little inkling of it. I'll give you guys a little taste of, of the uh, light mode before we actually go full screen, so don't worry. 100 Thieves. Um, really interesting team to talk about because, you know, 100 Thieves are kind of a historically bad team. Like this year's 100 Thieves you know, was kind of breaking records for just not being able to really achieve anything. Like it's looking through their stats and diving through, like you, you kind of just listen to a lot of the, the casting around them. Like I, I loved watching 100 Thieves cast to try to hear casters try to salvage positivity from a roster that just was, just like with my Jyn Air games, like, it's very difficult to cast teams like that. So 100 Thieves, as you know, ended last season 4-14 and on a huge losing streak. You might not know that they have pulled off a 2-0 victory week before. I believe it was week 3 of spring season was a 2-0, but this was their second 2-0 of the year. Um, this is on Oracle's Elixir right now, just looking over things like gold difference at 15. They weren't last, but they were down the bottom, but... First blood percentage, 33%. First turret rate, you know, actually not as low as everyone else, but actually taking the outer turrets, well, that proved very difficult. Like 100 Thieves really, really struggled. And kind of the stat that's like the most concerning is like just the champion kills per minute really on a super low ebb, 0.52 champion kills per minute, which tells you this not a lot a lot of things will happen. This is for both teams. In games, you know, if the game went 20 minutes, the score was like 8-2 to the enemy team often. It's like a, just 10 kills in the game kind of thing. And, you know, you flow on to, for context, to show you kind of what these stats mean, like, combined, like if it, the combined kills, you can see that 100 Thieves is way, way lower than most. Um... Average game time, much more on the longer ebb. Like 100 Thieves definitely struggled in spring. I think that's no one's surprise. Now, it was kind of unlikely for them to be this poor because the roster obviously has quite a lot of talent, even if together it wasn't really kind of pulling things off as it should. Kind of intriguing to me. You, know, you move forward to things like um, summer, so summer season, Kind of the surprising thing about 100 Thieves is that even after their victories, you look at goal difference of 15, and 100 Thieves is still super struggling. And this was a number that I, I wrestled with, right? Because they're 3 and 5. They're not 1 and 7. A, two th a negative 2,255 goal difference of 15 is really insanely large. As a counterpoint, 1649 for Team Liquid. Um, positive. Now, some of this is Sonataric related, the Sonataric getting run over too hard. But, you know, how much of it is is a fair question. You look over at... Um, this is where... Because I kind of dived in. I was like, okay, so what's actually happening in the lanes? And this is, again, Oracle's Elixir going into just 100 Thieves stats. The early game for them has proven to be a struggle of almost kind of epic proportions they actually have negative gold difference and xp difference at 10 and everything except afro's xp difference at 10 which might just suggest that he missed out on a roam timing that someone else got and thus got more lanes here so it's a completely pointless xpd stat so a lot of negatives um when it comes to basically all early game indicators so the first 10 minutes everyone is down in cs experience and gold which is really hard to do and by, by everyone obviously they have run a couple of different configurations of roster um and de definitely if it was 
kind of zoomed into one player. Like if you're talking about Fate God, you know, the, the lose lane win game kind of thing that he talked about is um, on the one hand true, on the other hand kind of echoes the anti-carry thing from some mid laners in the past. Um, so, you know, Keen, for example. So I think it's a hard one to fully talk about, but we'll talk more about that when we get to kind of track him in game. But um, yeah, I mean, 100 Thieves stats are very skewed and off. So it's another reason why reviewing them this week, I think, is valuable because they won two games, right? So it's going to be very interesting to to review kind of where they're going in terms of team. I've kind of been looking at someone like Excel. These are the stats that I wanted to show you guys in kind of um, connection is the team stats for Excel, who obviously are, you know, right now no hopers over in EU. And you'll notice like there's, there's negatives in this for sure, but there's things like, I mean, Mystique CSD doesn't actually matter. That one doesn't count. But, um, you know, Hyarnan when he was in, pretty decent CSD. Their XP differences are kind of up and down. Like this profile for a 0-6 team, you're like, okay, that's a thing that could happen. But this is a very unlikely profile for a team that has three wins. So I think um, 100 Thieves have been a statistical anomaly so far this season. I actually loaded up the LCK here because I wanted to show you guys kind of spring season ratings and things and just to give you kind of a, an idea like negative 1668 this is last season's like super no hope or junior that almost never looked like winning and only won three games and their gold difference is lower now i'm not gonna die on gold difference being the most important thing because in summer season gold difference at 15 can be heavily influenced by teams playing sonataric badly um and that can really run over their gold difference but just running sonatari doesn't guarantee your gold difference is negative we've seen many teams in korea play sonatari and have more gold than the enemy duo lane so it doesn't fully explain it but it's still just a very peculiar number and uh, griffin yeah 2245 you look at this number and wonder what could have been in that final and then you get sad like me and then you drink some alcohol later it's it's a thing, but um, yes, we're going to dive in and work out how this could happen and, and and how that could be connected to this and just learn about 100 Thieves because they're a team that has players I really like. I really, you know, I was a fan of Aphromoo's stream um, at the start of, of League and his Draven play when he was an AD carry and the rush hour bot lane. Like there was a lot of different parts around um, 100 Thieves. Bang is a really good guy. He comes and visits um, the LCK when he's around and um, really nice. Always spoke good English, was always kind of a friend, even when he was on SKT. He's a friendly guy. Um, so there's definitely good pieces on this team. Someday, obviously, a great top laner. But for it to all be so miserable in 2019, I thought about reviewing one of their losses to try to understand it. But we finally got a victory in order to work out just kind of what's been eating 100 Thieves and, and how good can they be and what can we learn from this draft. So we push through. Is that pastry time? Yeah, my boy pastry time doing the casting. So, so far, pick ban wise, Reap and Rapid Star, other friends of the, of the stream. So patch 912, Mordecai is disabled. Just zooming in on the bands, 100 Thieves have gone Yasuo, Aurelia, and the Sona. Blab is in for Cloud9. That does warp their playstyle quite a bit. I didn't dive into Cloud9 info in the pregame because we've accidentally reviewed them every week. Hasn't been intentional, but they've been reviewed every week. Um, we'll kind of catch up when we get in-game on Cloud9, kind of where I've seen them at, because we've reviewed losses from them the last couple of weeks. But first time reviewing with Blabber, so do expect a bit more aggression and potentially Niski needing to back up his jungler. Sona band to get rid of Sonataric. Cloud9 bands, power level, it's two power level bands. Um, Sejuani kind of fits into Amazing's playstyle. He's going to be more of a tank jungle player and not be mechanics focused. And the. Karma is just complete power level ban. And the Yumi ban, Aphrom has been practicing it a lot. 
I feel like North America has been more on the Lux train than than EU. Um, but I feel like I, I want to actually watch it because I, I don't know the pick band of this game. I haven't watched this game previously, in case you're wondering. But um, Yumi Power Level in Korea, I guess the respect is rising up again after teams have kind of started to work out. Like it's one of those phenomena where a champion is perma banned based on perceived power level, and then when it's left through, teams aren't prepared to actually win with it. And now we're seeing kind of the revolving door, and people are like, oh wait we know how to play Yumi now and we can show you that she's busted. So I guess I don't mind it, but pretty kind of vanilla bands from cloud nine. Um, but against hundred thieves, you don't feel like you need to index too much specific prep. They already had a victory at this point, but it was pretty awful game um, that they won the previous week. I actually forget. Was it against echo Fox? Um, it was either echo Fox or fly quest. I forget, but um I watched 100 Thieves' first victory live, and it was a very low-quality kind of grind-fest game where they just happened to have more of the balance of play over their opponents and then kind of ground out a victory in a really long game. But it was it was very, very low-quality. Like, that game always kind of haunts me because it had big... Was it Big is the top laner, right? Big solo killed... No, solo. Solo, solo killed... Um, fake god twice and then on the reaction cam it was basically him saying are you serious like as in like fake god had, had misplayed the, the trade so hard that he was you know just getting solo kills it seemed pretty effortlessly so um like that was just a game where i didn't really feel like i learned anything about 100 thieves they they won but I'm still like, we're on learning mode here. We're, we're definitely on learning mode. Um, and they first pick Aatrox, which almost certainly is going to be a top lane pick for them. It doesn't really fit Ryu or Amazing's playstyle to play this champion. Um, the Ryu mid lane Z days are kind of gone. I always think of Ryu playing mid range control mages um, almost all the time. Like he's just an Orianna Ari player forever in my mind, whatever the meta is. But uh, obviously, he can play other stuff. Not an Aatrox player in my mind. I'm sure he can lock it in. And then a Cloud9 take first round Akali Tom. Now Tom is taken. And it makes you wonder why. Because Tom in this spot is usually heralding the Sona pick when it comes to the LCK. You fall back and you can take Tom Varus. Now it's possible that Cloud9 take Tom here because they want to go for nebulously strong duo lane tom varus or utility lane tom ezreal tom ash and then just play double assassins and, and split 100 thieves to death and i actually think that's a pretty winning strategy against a player like fake god who hasn't showed a lot of lane aptitude is just to amplify how much the side lanes matter and just make the duo lane nebulously utility wave clear so i think that's fine but it's not it is suspicious against specifically 100 thieves for the aframu so for the left against aframu for the time can probably be so high like Zaya rakan is usually your go-to here so i would assume most teams would take Zaya at this pick because Zaya x is a million times better than rakan x and um you often just get Zaya rakan anyway so the tom kench there is very suspicious from from C9 side, it says something about, to me, the only reason to lock Tom there on 912, where it's powered down again, is something to do with your overall game plan and prep for the series. Okay, Zyra Khan, gonna be locked in for the side of 100 Thieves. One of Bang's best champions. Um, Bang, I think, went unheralded in a lot of 2017 and 2018. He was always a god on Zaya, really good Zaya player. We can actually draw the stat out here. Let's see what it looks like. Now there has been a lot of losses in 2018, so maybe the stat is skewed, but um, let me get it on screen. Give me one moment, guys. Let's give you guys something cool. So, this is gonna be hard to read, so I'm gonna try and Blow it up a little bit. Where's in? 
Let's get a big SK Telecom T1 bang. So this is the stat in case you guys are wondering. This is the website that I use to find out career win rates for players. Um, so a lot of it's in Korean, but you won't need to look it for it. It's in Ven, in case you guys are wondering. Um, so SK Telecom T1 Bang. This is all 640 games that Bang has played in Worlds and Riot tournaments until he joined 100 Thieves. So this is 2018 and previous um, stats. So he has 415 wins, 225 losses for an overall career win rate of 65%. 2,392 domestic kills. Amusingly, 999 deaths. He got out before 1,000. What a beast. Um, in case you guys don't know, he played on Xenix Blast, 13 games. Najin Shield, 46 games. SKTT1S, which is when he comboed with Wolf again after being in Najin together. All of his other results. But um, we're looking for Zaya win, right? So... You can look here. Look at this stat. This is why I loaded it up. It's actually better than I remember. So, playing Zaya in 19 games, Bang is 16 and 3, 84.2% win rate. That's a pretty pog win rate. He is a really good Zaya player. Um, in case you guys are wondering, maybe you're 100 Thieves fans and you're like, I heard Bang was really good and I know he plays Ezreal, but like, what are other champions that. I should look at from him. The Corky obviously harder to pull off in much later metas, so this is kind of an, an a um, irrelevant stat. But Bang's Callista was career undefeated for a very long time. I believe he was twenty seven and one before he more recently became thirty two and seven. Um, I think he lost for the first time in Kespa Cup twenty seventeen or something like that. Don't ask why I remember that. I know everything about Korean League of Legends, but uh, Callista would be kind of one that you really want to see, and you already know about the Ezreal, Silver, and Ash. But I uh, wanted to bring up Desire. The reason why I bring up this stat is, we talk about it on the LCK broadcast, but there were a lot of teams that took Rakan for power level um, over Zaya for a long time. And there was a time where it felt like Zaya and Rakan were both strong, and most teams would still go for Rakan because it gave them engage from support. SKT were very often... If we want Zaya Rakan, we lock Zaya because Bang is a god Zaya. And hopefully we get the Rakan. Maybe we don't, but at least we got Bang Zaya. So the win rate here, uh, including, again, the games he played in 2018 when SKT was losing a lot, shows you that Bang Zaya is like super, super hype um, decision or super hype thing to throw in. So you can close that and go back to the VOD. So Zaya Rakan coming in very natural. Um, and hopefully a sign that Aframu and Bang are much more on the same page because Zyra Khan in lane is much stronger if um, the two players are trading at the right times. And then the Ash is locked in. So this kind of cements what we were saying. You either pick, if you're going to first round Tom Kench, it either has to be Ezreal, Ash, or Varus. No other Tom Kench lane will really be played. It's when Zyra Khan is up, so you you know you have to be pretty s certain that Zyra Khan will be locked by 100 Thieves here. And you want to pick something that gets you a win somewhere. And Ash Tom Kench doesn't win lane against Zyra Khan. Um, the lane counters to Zyra Khan are pretty famous, right? Morgana Kate is one of the most famous ones. Lux Siver is run a lot in Korea where you don't win necessarily, but you have burst. Right? There is burst windows for... Um, Siver Lux against Zyra Khan. Basically, Rakan steps up too far, hit the binding, and then um, as long as you have like one AD item, even just a pickaxe, full rotation Lux Siver has a lot of burst onto squishy Rakan. So that kind of keeps it accountable. Tom Kench Ash is very much farm it out. Um, but this gives you Hawk shots. So when I see Akali and I see Tom Kench Ash, this game is going to be Sneaky and Zazel wave clearing in mid. And then Licorice and Niski splitting them to death is what I would assume from first round as prep in a match they're expected to win against 100 Thieves. So Elise banned away, famous amazing jungle pick of history. Played it a lot on TSM. Wave Clear Champion Bat, a lot of Azir bans coming out. It's close to 80% win rate in LCK, which is getting insane for the Azir. People are getting. 
finding more and more ways to make it work with Sejuani coming into the meta and games slowing down a little bit. There's a little bit less mid-game action than there was, at least in the MSI meta. Um, with so many of the flex assassins being nerfed, Azir gets to, uh, through an honest laning phase and through to two items a lot more reliably recently. And the Zillion Ban. The Zillion Ban here is really good, actually, because with Blabber in the lineup and with this start, I actually think the Zillion Ban's pretty inspired because if you jam, like, Kindred Zillion into this comp, then teamfight comp never gets to teamfights, right? Like, you jam Kindred Zillion in here, and then suddenly Hawkshot comes in, K Kindred's killing your jungler and stealing away his Gromp. Um, Ash I was flying in, and, like, Zillion's chasing at 100 times speed, right? So actually a really smart Zillion ban there. Um, and that does actually target a potential set-piece play that um, Cloud9 would be considering with the roster they have in. Now, you still want to pick a jungler who can invade, and it feels more like a pick-away here. Like, Blabber could have gone a lot of different ways. Rek'Sai's up, but I guess he doesn't want the Scar to match up. To me, that's the only reason not to go Rek'Sai here. But the Jarvan can also be played hyper-aggressive if you want to. And I would like to see hyper-aggressive Jarvan to make a draft like this work. And 100 Thieves have to blind pick mid. And they, they pick the victor, which is coming up. This is Ryu's kind of forcing this into the meta. And we saw one other victor player, if I'm not mistaken. Power of Evil, I think. Um, also playing the, the victor. I'm not convinced Victor is very good. Um, unless the enemy's already shown their mid laner, like as a blind pick. Against Akali, I guess you can wave clear and not die, but you have no lane priority there. It's it's kind of a flex pick, um, but usually only seen after a mage is locked in and top. Something like Kennen um, is where you would go there. And then it just ends up being ultra team fighting jungler. So this is super team fight comp but with very conditional initiation um with a map lead this comp can do a lot of things but if it loses the map it's actually not the best because the teleport flank from aatrox is pretty poor so you kind of need to be even to pull off the team fights here or c9 need to make mistakes to get the team fights to work here just because victor doesn't provide anything in terms of initiation gragas rakan not always the most reliable. The Silas pick on 912 is fascinating. We see Silas um, in Korea from Yukal. A bit of it, it's still a lot in the LPL, but that's still on patch 911. So I, I did wonder if the Silas we saw in the LCK was a product of um, scrims with Chinese teams, you know, still potentially involving the Silas. Like, Silas is not awful. But it, he was really super duper heavily nerfed on what he was good at before. And now he can only work in certain matchups. And maybe the idea is that Victor doesn't apply enough pressure in lane for Silas to be a viable lane choice against it. And then, doesn't matter, from level 3 onwards, he's an amazing dive buddy with Jarvan. You know? So like this can still work in the context of what they want to do. Because... Pre um, first augment, there will be priority times to roam on the victor. The kill pressure onto victor is pretty high um, with the Silas. And it does still play into these two guys get one item, farm in mid, and then these guys just dive things, which is not quite Zillion Kindred. So I imagine this will kind of be remembered as a really smart ban here. I don't know if Reaper can confirm or would want to confirm whether they were going to go Zillion Kindred comp here. But I think if you're going to run Blabber and hold last pick for mid, I wouldn't have thought it would be the um, Silas here, but it can make sense um, in the context of everything. So 131 comp from C9, I think is the way you want to go, can win skirmishes from ahead really easily. It's so much harder for 100 Thieves to win skirmishes because Aatrox needs a, a jungle advantage to do that most of the time and won't find that here. And then Victor and skirmishes, 
he needs items. Like he's pretty late game scaling in terms of his damage. Now bot side is a priority lane for hundred thieves. But we, we've got so much to learn about 100 Thieves. Like, I don't want to assume too much about 100 Thieves just because I haven't watched them with a critical eye. And the hope here, the hope for this first series, the hope for our 100 Thieves VOD review is what can we learn about the team that, as we kind of showed at the start, was almost record-settingly bad. Like, a team that had nothing to really hold on to in terms of what they brought in. Because before they started winning, like, what was 100 Thieves good point even on teams that have struggled in the past like you think of Jin Air and spring right R the bot lane like root was showing good performance and they could definitely make things happen around there but even the traditional strong points of 100 thieves like someday and spring is out of the team um the early game macro was passive uh, no one's performance level was above kind of average so for a team that had nothing to kind of build on, it had to be a full reset. That's why it's fascinating to watch how the team have come back um, in this week number four of action. Just listening to, and it might not be loud enough, just listening to probably what he's saying here. Positivity, it's exactly what you want. Say what you want about Polly's coaching, but he's a fantastic representative for an org. So C9 position very aggressively. Look at this, full court press invade here. This is not a defensive setup from C9. It's a very standard fan out from 100 Thieves. Plays into their role. They very much want to passively scale until the game becomes around objectives and they just have better team fight as C9 in, in a true um, objective fight. And then C9 want to set the tempo with very fast play around rotations and invading with their jungler. So that's the elevator pitch for the comps here. Oh, so close. So Licorice flashes, they double flash. Holy moly. Amazing, real. It's actually pretty greedy for this contest. The reason why I say that is, like, you watch how the early game played out. Like, Sneaky's camping lame brush. Like, the moment you see this, right? At 1 minute 10, Ash and Tom Kench didn't go to bot lane. Normally, at this point, you're either patrolling defensively or you're in lane trying to get a level 2 advantage. And it's Zyra Rakan, a lane that Tom Kench, Ash, loses to very hard level two to level one. So what, what I always try to explain is that Tom Kench level one is like abysmally awful, is a terrible level one champion, unless you camp the first brush and can just like get a health bar lead with your Q and your AD carry does the rest of the work. Cause you can't have two spells. You can't have a combat spell and also devour. It's impossible, right? At level one. So Getting like so many Tom Kench lanes, that even at the pro level, are lost at level one, where the Tom Kench player has to flash, like Core JJ at World, uh, sorry, at MSI, um, or it's a level two to level one, and then you build up the minion wave on the Tom Kench and die of him while he's still level one, and doesn't have devour. Like Tom Kench lanes are so important to be inspected at how they play the level one. So for them to just be in the mid lane jamming poke is suspicious. They're not trying to get a good lane state against Zyra Khan, one of the kind of premier duos. So at this point, 100 Thieves should say, huh, why are they mid lane? The only reason for them to be the mid lane is for there to be some sort of shenanigans going on. So Ryu backs off. Amazing face checking here is really, really risky. Like I'm sure he wants to put down a trinket ward, right? To spot for the... Um, you know, a spot for the potential for a three buff. Because I'm sure just like us, they look at the enemy team and they're like, huh, they're going to play high action. Amazing reads the game pretty well for a pro player. I think, you know, in his casting, you were able to pick up that at least, however you want to comment on it. So it is not a bad idea to put down a spotting award. This is not a, it's not a mistake to put down a ward because it's very easy to look at this and be like, wait, Scuttle doesn't spawn. Why does he need the ward? 
it's very much for three buffs and the potential for early priority C9 to roam in and do big things. But it's very greedy. Like I feel like Fake God and Amazing need to have communicated early how important the Trinket Ward is and had a Trinket Ward plan. And instead, they just get invaded on. But without getting the kill here, it actually is a trade-up for 100 Thieves because both, like, triple flash is used by C9. And C9 now has to start on enemy blue buff. Otherwise, they actually might be contested at one of their future buffs and put down. Now, more unrealistic, given that it's Victor and, and Aatrox, but, like, you kind of have to play towards your vision. The only thing they checked with was with their face. So triple flash, no kill there. Actually ends up being a very lucky kind of advantage for 100 Thieves. Does Ryu play this lane position right? Let's watch this. Now, Blabber is a level 2 cheese ganker, right? And you know there's no um, scuttle for him to go to. So the gank timing here is not surprising. He's on the right side of the map. So I think Ryu plays that fine. Like, you got to take trades. You can't give up level 2. I think it's fine. Good gank from Blabber, though. And yeah, okay. So isn't it nice when, without watching this game, we looked at the draft and said, this has to be high aggression, and then we see Blabber is... Uh, he's got some big Syndra Spheres this game because he goes straight through mid. His flag's still on cooldown, and he's going to contest bot side camps. Look at Amazing. This is really cool. I like how both sides play. Blabber says, it's my four buff game, guys. My 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 time's coming in. And then... Gragas walks in. I don't know what he has skilled. I probably should have seen that before. And hadn't revealed himself. And he, of course, saw Blabber walk on a ward as well. So this is, uh, this is really interesting. Seeing the level 2 contest on red. It's a lot of defensive vision. When was this all placed? Watching the defensive vision here. So many defensive wards placed. Because Rakan backs away and now they have... Yeah, two wards cap capturing a lot of what's happening bot side. Amazing on Krugs. Amazing desperately needs a Krugs ward but doesn't have it. So that's why he has to... Sorry. Um, Blabber really needs a Krugs ward in order to fully understand what happened there, and does end up losing the camp. So at the end of the day, Lab is going to get a full clear of his jungle three buff. The four buff is really hard if bot lane doesn't have priority. But as we talked about early game, the moment that Sneaky and Zazel poked around mid lane, it's basically impossible for them to also have priority pre four minutes. So you can't have everything in the game. Um, they, they were watching positioning on Victor for an invade. Not picking up the kill and not getting priority on bot side is what stops a four buff, but they got a three buff, so I think they can still feel really happy here. Oh! All right, double kill comes out here. Triumph proc is pretty big here. The gravity field positioning is super good from Ryu on this one. Let's watch how this gank actually happened, though. So, uh, Blabber knew Amazing was coming. That part we know. This is a terrible lane position for a Victor who really wants to shove it. And it's the god tier position for Silas. We always talk about melee champions like Aurelia and Silas. If they can freeze the wave or have it not pushing this kind of area, i.e., the line is drawn around here, then it's so easy to pop 1e and then with your jungler coming, hit a stun and it's crowd control outside of flash range against an opponent that doesn't have flash, so way away from his turret. So Amazing has to try to counter gank even though he's level two, no shop Gragas. Remember Gragas has no keystone at level two because um, he hasn't been able to shop and buy boots. So he's level two, doesn't have all abilities and doesn't have a real keystone. So you need to nail the gravity field here. Otherwise, it's an instant double kill. Triumph proc is the 81 health heal, in case you're wondering. It's 
So active early game. And we're going to have to watch how Blabber resets and continues to invade because he's very much a one-note player. Like, Blabber will always play this out like Reaper told him it needed to be played out. He's like, oh, I'm an aggressive player, and Reaper said I got to get in there and contest. My laners will back me up. I'm always going to do that. And with his youthful exuberance will probably come mistakes and, and moments where he's too aggressive. So we'll kind of be able to judge from the minimap how aggressive he's been. He's only now clearing his red buff at five minutes, which is so late than you would have uh, assumed. Let me farm out from here. But this is what you want from Cloud Nine's draft. You want Blabber big, and he needs to go Warrior Enchant to make the counter jungling style work. Yeah, they were a hundred percent gonna play Zillion Kindred this game. So um, the pivot to Warrior Jarvan is fine, and I guess they were afraid of Warrior Rek'Sai being owned by um, a Skarna pick, and the fact that Warrior Rek'Sai doesn't provide full back engage if the kind of matchup didn't suit them in terms of counter jungling. So that's probably why it all came together like this. Standard roam timings from supports. We'll pause the game at 15 minutes and go back to the, the numbers we looked at, right? From memory, they're 15 minute stats. We'll check them. Um, LCS summer regular season. No, 10 minute stats. We'll pause at 10 and go back to the stats and see how they're looking. But the only priority lane they picked is bot lane. Um, and right now, that's the only lane with priority. Was Graga spotted for this Drake take? What information did they have here? So it's on a control ward from the enemy. And Scuttle's top side spawn. This is a very alpha thing to do. But even though they're in between multiple enemy control wards, they know Victor's on a back timing because he used... Ah, okay. This is cool. So here's what happened here. What happened is, we'll wait for the moment where it happened. So what happened in this play was that um, Silas was about to freeze the wave or attempt to freeze again, and Ryu just used his ult to push. It's something that was debuted by the best player to never make it to Worlds in Doinby. Um, when he used to play Victor in the first Victor meta of 2015-2016, he would always ult basically at level 6 or 4 lane control, because guess what? You always get first shove with the Chaos Storm. You just ult the minion wave. Hopefully you get the champion as well, but that doesn't matter. And then you get to shove. Um, and it gives you a better back timing or a better roam timing. So when he saw Silas was threatening to uh, hold the wave after already teleporting, Victor uses ult and backs. Now the moment Victor ults, oom, and backs, he has to go for a full reset. And that's why C9 runs straight at the Drake, start it up. And yes, you could try to TP in as Victor, next to that Ocean Drake sign, but that's too risky. And all the priority bot side is turned around because Jarvan's here, freshly shopped with double longsword. Victor's on a back timing. Silas is going to get there first. It's actually a really smart Drake time that again plays into the win condition from C9. They're trying to blitz 100 Thieves between 20 and 25 minutes, try and play super aggressive. And given that Victor's back timing, which as we know, and it's been mentioned in chat here, is very often based on an early hex score, you usually back first before hex score because you can't just have no effective stats in the early game. So you usually back and get, um, you know, it used to be second Doran's ring. At some points it was double dark seal, but then you need that hex score to get any semblance of shove and stop Niski from being able to hold the wave as easily. Second timing, he has to do it. Blabber comes in freshly shopped and now has warrior enchant. Good setup from C9. 100 Thieves, understandable sacrifice, given that if you're going to play Victor, you're probably not getting first rate because Victor is not strong at contesting those objectives. Because now Blabber has honestly got the potential to play this game as if he's Peanut from the Buffless game, right? He has Warrior Enchant finished. His lanes are both going to be able to rotate first. He has Utility and Roam from his bot lane, so he should always know what camps are up. And C9 get to take some liberties because they can do this. The moment you do that, you get the camp respawn timer or you see if it's up again. Blabber invades the red. The tempo here is super high from C9 as it needs to be in a draft like this. 
So, so far, I like C9's draft. I know a lot of people had issues with it in terms of what it can do. But for them to lose this game, there's going to have to be a point where they skip steps or they just make a mechanical mistake and that gets punished. So, Ash Arrow play tried. Optimistic. Let's see what the main... Aphromu walks up to contest a control ward. Very optimistic that you're going to get the kill through this. But uh, you understand why it was tried. Right, Kali does super good against Aatrox in the 1v1 now. Oh, what happened here? So Gragas was bot side. He has no camps up. So you you would have to think that C9 knows he's going to be bot side. Because he has nothing else to do. His Raptors just came up. So there's a chance he timed that out was going there. But... Given the Ash Arrow was used bot, the best use of Amazing's time is to go in the bot brush. Damn, and they get the they get the kill here. This is really important for them to actually start getting some lane presence bot. This is all amazing, right? Amazing just goes in with the lane ward that's just about to time out. Did Cloud9 know there was a lane ward there? It's actually important to know. Sorry for all the rewinding for some of the people who want to see all the action. When did the blue ward go down? It's on top of the red ward. It's actually hard to tell. Bang puts down a lane ward. Okay, very interesting. So what happens is, I'm watching the respawn times. No ward available. You can see in the bottom left of the screen. Trinket ward's up now. Bang puts down a trinket ward in the brush when Ash and Tom were pushed in. If you notice from here, Cloud9 has no way to know this brush is warded because the minion wave doesn't aggro someone standing in it. And then there was action happening. So they actually have no scouting that there's a ward in this brush from the side of um, 100 Thieves. Bang's ward actually ends up being super important here because a lot of action happens. And remember, they're playing top side of the lane. So usually you get this scouted out by a minion wave aggroing on you that tells you about um, the ward being placed there. And that's how they get this kill here. Like Zazel thinks that even if Amazing is bot lane, which... He doesn't know for sure. He could be on Raptors. They have double control ward from the 100 Thieves side. He could just be carrying Raptors. But even if he's bot lane, which is very possible, his Jarvan has been very recently around the lane. And this requires a full all-in from the person who's not in vision. Like Aphrom is not giving a tell that his jungler is there. So actually 100 Thieves play this really well. And Cloud9, like this would be really frustrating for Zazer because the ward just times out. The all-in is successful, and they have to pull off everything to make it happen. So that was really cool. Really cool moment there. Um, Red team didn't have vision of the ward going down. They had no indication that there was a ward in the bush. It was from Bang rather than the support kind of jamming one into the lane. And it was a deep ward as well, which would have spotted people coming from lane. So really cool ward there, and 100 Thieves make a proactive play. And they're a team that hasn't been known to do that. Because you just watch this. You need to watch Aphromoo, because Aphromoo at no point gives away that his jungler is here. He's level 5. Like, this is absolutely... Like, consider Zazel's life here. Zazel's like, doo dee doo doo My life is wonderful. I am Tom Kench. The nurse didn't hurt that much. And then he gets instantly popped and dies, right? He has flash up to make this play happen. The only way this works is if there's no tell from the support and jungle, and that they perfectly layer it. Otherwise, the Gragas all, you know... Bounces him into the turret. That's really nicely played by 100 Thieves. And we should pause. Because it's 10 minutes in. And we should look at CS numbers. And, you know, we, we talked during the pregame, in case you're joining us late, about how this is such an unrealistic picture. You know, gold difference at 10. CS difference at 10. So, fake guard, negative 3.3. At 10 minutes, you can tell. We can go back, I guess, to give you the exact timer. So we're at 1027. Negative 16 for fake guard. 
Um, amazing's down. Sorry. Oh, yeah, let me see. We'll move this closer so we don't mess up. Amazing's down normally eight. And this game is down 15. Now, this one's very acceptable. Very acceptable for Amazing to be down here because his job has been so tricky, right? Um, he's had to deal with Blabber being the MVP god of the early game in terms of damage and pathing and people backing him up. So that part's fine. Ryu is always as a player been pretty weak in the laning phase after about 2013 even 2014 his laning wasn't super great um and then afterwards obviously it kind of went way down so ryu normally down seven he's down six fine it should get better but i mean the lane spaces being awkward for him hurt him there bang's up five so at least bang is in a, in a better spot in terms of cs than usual this game so, this is not the best representation of the team, but it's just kind of, let's thought experiment kind of what we're seeing here with what's happening on the enemy side. We're going to expect a pretty big XP difference um, between Amazing and Blabber, because Blabber's got two kills and Amazing lost out on jungle camps. But uh, you just know that the lanes that weren't even played around kind of fall into this side. And it's why, specifically around top lane, I find it the most tricky to accept the idea that Fake God is a, a lose lane win game kind of guy because we've had that in the LCK before, right? I think players with great teleport usage or really great team fighting tank players, I think can fall into a lose lane win game style. You think of Marin locking in Maokai out of meta for a long time just because he knew the team fights would um, come together. But I think Fake God going into skill matchups and, and kind of losing a bit to losing a lot, and like we say, him getting solo killed so many times by solo in the previous game that 100 Thieves played, makes me err very much on the skeptical side without knowing what his TP plays and stuff look like this game. C9 continue their style. We talked about it in draft. They've picked a comp that doesn't vertical jungle. They've picked a comp that three buffs and a comp that gets every buff. So they've gotten every buff on the map, basically. Like, what buffs have gone to 100 Thieves this game? They got a delayed red buff and maybe blue. But they did not get the second red buff. They didn't get the first blue. And they lost out on Ocean Drake. And now they're going to lose out on Rift Herald because... C9 can rotate first with the comp they have. And C9 need to do this. This is C9 playing well, but also their win condition is don't allow 30-minute team fights for the enemy. Blabber just... Wait, what was that ult? Okay, never mind. I was like, wait. And then it was Niski's ult. That makes sense. Bounces away, gets to Rift Arrow. They don't have to fight for it unless they want to. This is really rough from C9. Okay, so. So far, C9, I think first 11 minutes have played really well. Yes, Zazel died in bot lane, but we were able to get the analysis to understand that, um, you know, there was no way to realistically um, expect the full-on engage from the Gragas. But what happens here is important. C9 get the objective. All right, we got Rift Herald. And you look at items, and they're in a decent combat spot, but... If Zaya's there, they actually don't have an AD lead on their Ash, right? She's got Essence Reaver, not Essence Reaver done. No one item done on Silas. No one item done on Akali. The Silas one possible, the Akali one impossible at this point. Warrior Enchant done, but Runic Echo. So if anything, in terms of spent gold right now, I feel like 100 Thieves have stronger items than, than Cloud9 do. But Cloud9 have what we've talked about, which is the ability to push first, the ability to rotate first, the ability to outnumber with high mobility. You don't actually want to properly 5v5. And that's why the disengage first idea is smart. But then the re-engage here is a really curious one because it's EQ into R. So damage-wise, you can see that EQ into R, Amazing loses, what, 150 health from this? Because they've got the objective. They could be done here. But then Cloud9 say, okay, we're stronger, let's fight early. We don't want to fight later. And EQR comes in for 250 damage, but that's all Blabber's going to get. And after this, 
He's in cask range. The rest of 100 Thieves are walking up. Now, Cloud9 don't know the exact timing Zaya's going to get there, apart from later than the enemy. But they have to know Ryu's going to be there soon. And Cloud9 tr try to just straight line engage and try to make this an uneven fight. If you blow up Amazing, then it's 5v4 with allies coming from out of position directions, right? But the moment that EQ goes wide, or if Amazing doesn't die, actually 100 Thieves can make this a square team fight. The bounce here is like actually god tier because it bounces into damage from the allies' side. And then 100 Thieves are in position. Ryu actually gets a front line in the way of having terrain around him. Like this is basically the same as a tank because these people can't attack Ryu from this angle. So Ryu gets a flank timing while it's a, you know, a fight in this area where 100 Thieves own defensive kiting. They can kite back and there is no ward from Cloud9 in that brush. So C9 are fighting on enemy territory in a really awkward spot where they can't use... That if their bot line gets zoned 1v2 and Blabber is already almost out of the fight. So C9 make this really complicated for themselves because there's a call to go in and then Blabber just dies. Like his flash is down. Like there's no way for him to get out here. So we talked about how Cloud9 would need to make a mistake for this game to fall out of their hands at any point. And that's the execution mistake we're waiting for. But this is cool from uh, C9. Really well played by C9. Let's watch a couple of different things. So was pointed out in chat. We should talk about it. The control ward present here. Um, we don't know who to attribute that control ward to. I'm guessing it's Ryu's. Allows Ryu to come into the fight and not actually go all the way around to group in the back here. And to use the terrain like we mentioned. So Ryu plays this team fight super well. To be able to come from the flank. Realize that, you know, AD carries in the front line, double lift remembers, Victor is very strong at putting down the gravity field, the chaos storm, and, and taking over. And, you know, this is just really well played by 100 Thieves, but unnecessary given it's an unforced error from Cloud9. They already got an objective, so they don't, it's not even a blue buff to fight for. But the reason why I replay all the way is, is that Licorice stays in lane. Niski's there ostensibly to wave clear, but... It's a really good gank timing. Because everything from this side is predictable. The reason why I say that is... You see them enter, you assume everyone is going to fully disengage. And Zazel still has his ultimate to come up for the two kills. So it actually ends up with an out, uneven kill trade. Because Cloud9, who have always been able to do this, by the way. it's The thing I've always respected about Cloud9 is that Reaper instills in his players a lot of belief in making proactive shot calls and being able to find little advantages by next leveling enemies. They go for a full disengage, but because the minion wave's not going to reveal, that's why um, Licorice enters the brush and isn't spotted, and why Zazel stays. The only tell that something happens here is such a small one you'd never see in... Uh, like in the game, but actually Licorice does bounce the minion wave. And it, I think it does affect how the minion wave enters. If you notice, the minion wave is actually spacing wise is closer here between the first two minions and it is between the seconds, which suggests that it was pushed at some point. That doesn't mean necessarily that Akali is in the brush, but it means it's possible. But um, yeah, that's the sort of thing you, you just are unlikely. Because these guys are just saying, can you just help me push? Can you just help me push? Like, let's get out of there. But this is like the only unseen spoiler that actually ends up being the site of their demise. Like, they think they're fine to to exit this area, but it's a nice re-engage from C9. Really cool, really well played by C9. It's the sort of thing that Reaper trains his players really, really well. Uh, I've been there for a lot of VOD reviews with C9 um, years ago. And he's always very active for talking through kind of what to do in certain scenarios. And it's, I think, one of the reasons that he's a really good coach. Anyway, we return to normal. So you see people in chat criticize the Ash pick. And Ash has always been a really big champion in the LCK. Prey or no prey, it's always been big. So, and I know that it's just picked a lot less in other regions than it is in Korea. Um, 
Ash is the perfect jungler for this comp. So the perfect, sorry, AD carry for this comp because her job is to help Blabber be stronger and help their skirmish comp outnumber in skirmishes. Whether that's Hawkshot to always know what jungle camp is respawning in the right order, or it's the Ash Arrow to find the CC for the flanking Licorice or the flanking Niski. There is no better AD carry in this comp than Ash. If Ash is banned, you can consider Sivir just to have movement speed, but that's all that Sivir is going to provide because Cloud9 are trying to snowball super hard in the early game. And watching the play here. Oh, nicely played by Bang and Wolf. Bang and Wolf. Bang and Aframu. Old habits die hard. How this start? The Zyra Khan returning to lane. They're going to be spotted on a lane ward when they get there. I believe Aframu has definitely been spotted at this point. But the all in here seems like it's going to be innocuous. But with summoners down, it's actually really, really good from Aframu. Look at this. You know, this is a player who was so heavily criticized um, for his. Rakan play um, makes a proactive all in, knowing that they have the victor responding first. They don't have full vision of topside, but Akali is in lane, and they make this play completely independent of the jungler or the top laner's positioning. So it's really well done by Aframer. This is Zaya Rakan. Like I think you definitely want to ban Zaya away from 100 Thieves next time they play. I don't think you care about Aframu on Rakan X, but Get Bang Zaya away. Stop Zaya Rakan from allowing Aframu easier engage options with the extra battle dance range if it goes wrong. Is already my prep on 100 Thieves here. And I'm impressed with this look from 100 Thieves because whenever I've checked in with them, um, there hasn't been... There hasn't been the ability... Even just the inkling for 100 Thieves to, to make those proactive moves. So we looked over the, the 10 minute gold difference and things like that before. But C9, you know, again, picked for Snowball and they've gotten some of that to Ocean Drakes. They got the Rift Herald, they got some Tarblades, they have a gold lead. But this is the sort of comp that needs to win on item spikes in the early to mid game. Like the one item, two item spikes that we always talk about as boiler point cast of points are very, very important to. Um, to talk about when you have the enemy having better 5v5, which you know is very clear in this comp. No, oh, I don't know what the pause is about. Jump through the pause. This game is very finely poised. Kind of, if you evaluate the, the first 15 minutes, you say C9 picked a very high tempo, need to invade, need to back up the jungler comp, got the jungler up, 30 CS up, um, two kills. Um, they picked the Ash to kind of help out the team. I, Sneaky can never be the hard carry of this game. That's the reality of a game like this is you're amplifying the focus top side. You're always going to be invading or playing around the solo lanes. And Sneaky has a Tom Kench and just has to play defensively and throw out Hawk shots. That's the reality um, of what you're opting into in this game. That's the contract you sign with the Ash. But it needs to be now... No champion can answer Gunblade Akali's effectiveness at one item. Uh, Silas needs to be invading and finding plays because there's no fallback for Cena. There's no, we'll just out team fight them. That's not how this comp can work. The moment Bang has Hex Drinker or QSS, he's going to be so hard for Akali to interact with. And from there, Akali and Silas try to pop in, can't kill Bang, and Victor will do so much damage if you run into him. So. It needs to keep up like this. So I would say C9 knows their win condition, has largely played smartly around it, made one very poor decision to re-engage at EQR on the um, fight after Rift Herald, but otherwise have been able to, to play correctly. So let's wait and see where it goes from here.
think this is where C9 needs to start using their TP advantages. They really need to, the next way to make the game faster is a play like they're trying here. So let's watch how this one goes. Let's slow it down. So they come for the surround here. They're investing their defensive TP at first, and then now everyone's coming down. It's a really good teleport spot for Fake God. Losing two for zero here, three for zero here is actually three for one is almost game breaking for um, C9's comp. So let's talk about why this happens. It's a very interesting play. So Amazing's already in position. So shout out to him for reading the map again pretty well. It's something that he's been good at doing. So he's here. He's got a control ward behind him. Blabber has to use EQ to get in and consider that actually teleport ward spots here for Cloud9 are desperately poor. Like, where do you teleport to? Your options are Jarvan's flag, if he comes in with a ward here, a control ward, which is not going to actually stop 100 Thieves from doing anything. They're either going to fight or they're going to disengage. They're in really awkward timings here. And Fake God has already left Akali to ensure that Akali can't just R him to start an all-in, but also stop the teleport. So... Having this forward ward that was placed very recently is like a god tier teleport ward. And between control ward in the second brush, control ward in the tri brush, and the forward ward, 100 Thieves actually have the surround in terms of how can we have all our players show up because everyone knows what they need to do. Atros can teleport onto the flank ward. Victor can walk the fastest way possible straight through Tri because Silas is going through River and he has Tri Brush Control Ward and the rest of the team's in position here. So actually the setup for 100 Thieves defensively around bot lane is that they clearly read that this is where C9 wanted to play. And breaking the bot lane turret into putting Ash, Tom Kench mid lane is a very standard play, right? You desperately want to break the turret with, say, Ezreal Kench or... Kate Kench or Ash Kench, and then put Ash Kench, Ash, sorry, Ash um, Kench mid lane in order to threaten that utility around the map. So 100 Thieves is aware of this, so that's really good preparation. Blabber puts down a control ward, and that ends up being the teleport spot. Now, it could have been just the flag, it ends up being the control ward, but it importantly is not a ward here, i.e. in the second brush. You really want Licorice coming in from a flank or Silas coming in from a flank. Otherwise, battle lines are drawn. If Bang never has to respond to someone behind him, he can focus all attention on what's in front of him. And the moment the Bang can just look like this, you're pushing feathers, you're pushing feathers, you're waiting for a blade caller. You never have to turn your model, which is really important for Zaya. And guess what? Flash is a full team fight reset more often than not because you're flashing towards safety. There's no threat behind you. So this becoming a square 5v5 plays into why 100 Thieves will be very powerful in the late game because in the late game, Zaya kites back, Victor kites back. If anybody comes into this area, you get blade collared or just exploded by a Victor. That's just the reality because Victor does so much damage when you come to him. And Fake God's teleport here is God tier. So as you play through the fight, the moment Fake God gets this reset, Fake God can't be contested by multiple members in the front line. He can also be the last person out, so he can be a lot safer. Licorice has to come in from an awkward angle, gets a bit of damage, but gets focused on by both Ryu and Bang. So if Akali with Gunblade is never singling anyone else out and the front line's dying, that's just already very early in the game, pre-30,000 gold in the game for 100 Thieves, a team fight victory. And the moment you see that, you're like, oh. Now suddenly you try to repeat those tempo plays that Akali needs to do to win the game and you don't have an item lead. You don't have Ash Tom Kench in the mid lane as early as you want. I think what Cloud9 should have done here, in case you're wondering, okay, 100 Thieves had a good defense there. How could Cloud9 have approached it differently? I think looking for an earlier lane swap and putting Ash, Tom, Kench mid lane 
is kind of your go-to. I think you wanted to be already with the side laners in side lanes with TP advantage because they did have multiple teleports up in this fight. But Agniski's teleport was up, Licorice's teleport was up, but the map was quite narrow. What I'm saying by that is because of where the fight was fought, Niski had a dead summoner in the teleport because he was roaming down at the same time as his allies and the enemies. If you're playing it through mid lane and then Abyssal Voyage goes top while a teleport comes in and the Christian lane, you're getting something out of TP. You're opening up the map. But in a play like that, the map was actually narrower than Cloud9 expected. And this is in a game where they have a map control comp. These tempo drafts that invade and take over red buff and Drakes and Rift Herald are kind of like a map control draft because they're just basically saying, hey, cool red buff, what if we had two people there to kill you? And you're just always very, very scared and your CS lead is only likely to increase as the Jarvan over Gragas based on early pressure. But the setup they had allowed fake god to flank teleport and two teleports to mean almost nothing so that was kind of how cloud nine just got themselves into a weird spot trying to play this fast draft doesn't mean the game is over doesn't mean it's been decided but yeah things are awkward here point in chat if kench hadn't eaten j4 hs wouldn't have gotten reset yes but it seemed very likely that he would just kill the Jarvan. He was very low in health as well. So I agree that you really don't want to be using Tom Kench eat on Jarvan, but they kind of were in a, a really awkward spot. And now actually 100 Thieves get first turret against Ash Tom Kench, which, yeah, it's the, the bot lane assignment now needs to be arrested quickly. I think you always want to rotate first as an Ash lane, whether you get the bot lane turret pure through smart ganking or you end the laning phase put your 131 champion bot lane and then just you know brute force a counter lane swap from the enemy but scenarios like this where c9's lost river control bot side where the next objective is like they're recreating it they're putting down a control ward but c9 no they just can't give up any objectives and yet there's more items in the game for hundred thieves and they would want that like you should almost never have gold parity in a game that looked like this from the start when it comes to c9 because i wanted to speak on some kind of macro points the thing we observed from uh, consistently from C9 games this season so far has been Licorice making a couple of laning errors and also kind of trying too hard to be the carry and being caught out in awkward spots. Now that hasn't been on display in this game. And he had a very good game with Niski the next day, but I was kind of wanting to watch this series to see how Licorice was looking for C9 because I thought his performance level in summer so far has been a bit disappointing. It's another fight where, if you notice, like they end up trading two for one, but you'll notice these fights are looking really hard for C9 to win. And I think it's because their setups for them are a little bit indifferent. Like, if you zoom out a bit, why can't Silas be top lane um, to start this play and have a deep ward somewhere in the Hundred Thieves jungle, because again, we've talked about how this draft is about getting in there and being super, um, you know, proactive and taking over camps like the red buff they took earlier. And then Silas threatening a, a teleport flank, because again, that's what double TP should mean in this game. And there's no need for the lane assignment they have 
Now, if you choose that lane assignment, because Ryu has a matching teleport, etc., etc., obviously Silas has a much better flank teleport than the uh, Victor, who's kind of like Gangplank, kind of needs to set up for something. And it also just gives you a way to play out these fights, or you just don't go for fight engages, like you try to leash the Drake and turn off it, but that's not as easy with a setup like this, where you don't have a frontline tank to just ignore ba the Infernal Drake damage. But like Niski is making a very hard engage. It's protobell into the quickness when his E is on cooldown, so he can't actually gap close. He's only kind of looking like tasty, tasty bait. Gragas is standing there next to Blabo, has to flash out instantly. Ryu's fighting with Bang again, and there's once again no threat behind him to begin the fight. And it gets better. Like, this is a nice play by Licorice, where he, I believe, this is R flash, right? He R flashes to get a double stun. But, like, again, you're forcing a fight with R flash on Licorice for a 0.5 second stun. If you notice, watch R flash. Gets a double stun on Bang and Aframu. That surprises Bang. He's not expecting to get flashed on by Akali, of all people. That's not the threat you're thinking that you're going to see. And Niski hits the E. They do chase and get two kills overall because they can kite onto the, the um, Aatrox. So overall, like, Licorice's flash play gets them the bonus kill instead of just a one-for-one. One, but it's very... What's the word? It's very kind of transparent. It's very over-aggressive compared to other game states that C9 would have drafted for. And I'm sure on Reaper's VOD review, it's all very labored to get fights that are not even kind of smashing the enemy with even though the item timings are great right they just finished zonia's onto the aatrox so the akali already had the the gun blade like item timing wise they're set up to win fights but the fights are super awkward with the, how overforced they are when there were other scenarios that c9 were very good about um setting up in the early jungle pathing but now seem way more disconnected Nicely played. Let's watch how this started. So Bang sees Ash teleport in the mid lane. Has a cooldown advantage on that. And then Victor and Akali are topside. Predictably, Akali just kind of runs at Victor. Now, information-wise, C9 have a good diagonal line. Like They have a line of visions. They have kind of an idea of what's going on, but none of it's spotting relevant things to plays on the top side at the moment and then how far is too far is kind of the question for licorice to answer without flash the tp genuinely surprises him because he assumes no teleports are available in this scenario like niski's teleporting defensively how does this start He sees this teleport and then calls for Nisty to come in second, but 100 Thieves have been first on both teamfight teleports so far on the top and bot side. The thing that's clearest for me is that 100 Thieves communication, which has been one of the big things people have criticized, with Bang coming onto the roster to make it mixed language, etc. I feel like with Ryu and Bang there, I guess to balance out kind of the English-Korean divide to have you know a secondary maybe translating voice in Ryu, TP timing wise, 100 Thieves have been better at TPs than Cloud9. I think Cloud9 have traditionally been a good teleport team. So, this is a really good teleport play from Bang. And the fact that 100 Thieves have been able to rotate twice first, I think is pretty notable for a team that Costa said never could do anything. Like, Ryu walks down. Look, this is actually even better. Watch what happens here. Ryu puts down the war during the chase. And that's the ward Bang comes into. So the Ryu Bang... Okay, actually, I tell a lie. It's the minion. But you know what I mean? Like, the, the war that's put down on the chase there is important in spotting and guaranteeing a kill for Bang. Because whether Bang's teleporting on this ward or teleporting on the minions, the ward being there means that Licorice has no brush to juke into after his shroud is done. So Licorice tries to disengage, and the moment that Bang shows up, he knows he's going to be able to kill Licorice, because Licorice has no option to fully disengage. Like, there's no way for him to get out. So, that's a really good connection between Ryu and Bang. Like, that's really important there. 
And that's, again, the sort of next level play that with the Huhi configuration, even with Soligo in the roster, we were not seeing 100 Thieves make proactive or even reactive teleport plays like that that were very likely to get them leads. Like, that's cool to see from 100 Thieves. Like, that's them showing some, like, veteran shot calling. And that's the sort of thing that Ryu and Bang and Aframu should bring to a team. Steady, solid shot calling that reacts to scenarios well. And now C9's actually in a scenario that's quite hard for them to battle out of unless they pull off a teleport play because they're getting pushed in in the mid lane. Gunblade Akali, she can still kill Aatrox, but she's going to need to. Like They need something to change this game because they're down in turrets in a game where at times they've controlled 75% of the map real estate. So they have to find a way really soon to set the tone because if 100 Thieves can just put down control wards around one objective and force C9 to come to them, they're just going to win. And kind of worryingly for C9, the fights that we've been reviewing where Bang only had one way to look at and one way to respect are the sort of fights that 100 Thieves was only supposed to get around objectives in the mid to late game but you play c9's comp perfectly the game ends at 26 minutes and 100 these never got a real team fight so a lot of box botched execution from c9 um in how to play out this draft after about 12 minutes on that blue buff invade but i'm liking how 100 thieves are problem solving team fight kind of puzzles better and team fight tactics is basically what we're seeing from 100 thieves like they're puzzling out scenarios where they have different chess pieces they want to put down and different resources better than C9. So, I don't know. Maybe they're just a better team fight tactics team. Who knows? But uh, in this game, we're liking what we're seeing so far from 100 Thieves. And we haven't even got to the pop-off point. The only thing I saw from this game was that 100 Thieves won and that Bang got the perfect Captain Jack. So, I'm just waiting for the... The Captain Jack play at this point, to be honest. I'm, I'm greedy. I want to see the, the bang play. Like, it's amazing that after 3 buff into 3 buff, Cloud9 don't control either side of the 103's map. But those two team fights have cost them that their vision line is only River. And that sounds like a lot because River control is so important. But for a comp that... Dot wanted to dodge team fight at all point. They need river control and one extra quarter. Shout out to Amazing Man. Amazing comes in, pops Predator, double flash. Same thing. I mean, the Rakan also doing a lot of help there. Should you ever double flash? Let's think about it. What's being threatened here? Zazel should always flash. He doesn't have QSS. I guess they have to double flash. If he had cleanse or QSS, I think only Zazel flashes. But spit range is relevant here. We had a game in the LCK where um, SKT lost in three games to Dumb One. And that's because in a fight around this area, uh, Mada tried to devour and then spit out Teddy to safety. But the d spit range being reduced on patch 912 to 250 range meant that they just couldn't spit him far enough into safety. And actually, Sneaky, sorry, actually, um, Teddy would have been better just flashing defensively around here. Now, this is a little bit different because they're so far down the lane, but the latest Tom Kench nerf actually does affect this scenario because Zazel needs QSS or Cleanse in order to be safe there. All right, re engage happens. What's the map state when this re engage happens? They Licorice is there first. Did Licorice and Fake God ever see each other? The answer is no. They were actually ships in the night until this point. How did the rotation from bot lane happen? Akali pushed a lane. Aatrox never saw Akali leave. And isn't this awesome? If you actually watch the um, Akali and Aatrox, both of them leave lane and neither of them spot each other 
until the team fight starts because of control ward vision. Very interesting there. Faco would be the first person to see anyone. Now, again, it's terrain that doesn't suit Cloud9. They're fighting in a spot where they still show no backline threat. And, you know, Akali and... To a lesser extent, Warrior Jarvan, but definitely Akali and Silas are assassins, basically, in team fights. right? They want to get onto the backline and kill one person. They don't have any AoE abilities apart from AoE damage on Q and R from Akali on her way to killing the person she wants to R2 really badly. So this is a comp that works really good on flanks, but doesn't chase down one lane very well. This is a comp that we've already talked about where Zaya pushes out straight damage, Victor pushes out straight damage, and Chaos Storm. Bladecore comes back. This is a comp that only fights in one direction, and it's a fight under a turret for 100 Thieves. So someone's likely to get separated. It ends up being Niski, who just about gets out. But it's another really forced engage for C9 because they skip steps. If you're a C9 fan, you're trying to work out why does it look so forced? Is it the comp's fault? The answer is no. The thing about these pick comps that have a lot of single target burst that get a lot of map control is if you don't have mid lane outer turret, especially, but to a lesser extent, all three outer turrets, there just is so many more defensive ways to set up. But mid outer turrets down, then Akali can be bouncing over walls to threaten and things like that. But specifically them being a bit inflexible with their teleports has meant that 100 Thieves have always had somewhere defensively to teleport, so to, to defend around, and they've been on point with their teleports. So if you keep your turrets up and you teleport into team fights to set up some more square team fights as 100 Thieves comp, actually Cloud9's comp can't deal with that. So this is um actually been a really rewarding watch. I actually feel like I've, I've been able to observe a lot from this game more than I first expected. Still more to go though. 100 Thieves, still got defensive vision. I wonder like, how many aggressive wards has 100 Thieves gotten in 2019? The answer can't be that many. I just, I can't remember many games where their vision line was in front of the, uh, in front of the river. Nice deep ward there for a pick. It's a cool ward put down by Cloud9 before. And now 100 Thieves just want to find a way to make this game around Baron. Put down Baron Vision. Push out bot side, keep their control ward up, and go back to Baron Vision game. Oh, we're going to see a team fight here. Who's ganking who? All right, so flag teleport here to get something approximating a flank from Licorice. He gets onto the back line, he just desperately wants to take down Ryu. This is really interesting. So Blabber hits a ward, and then two different initiations happen. So Let's talk about the map positions here. Licorice in base coming in for a teleport. He's feeling a TP play. Aatrox a bit out of position for the play. He's going to back second, but that's fine. Zaya's much closer to this fight than Ash is. Tom Kench ult is up, so could be used for a collapse play here. So the all-in happens. Akali teleports in. Zaya's going to be there way before Ash unless an Abyssal Voyage play happens. Zazel's level 12. He has enough range to get in from that area. Aatrox can teleport in to stop late entrances and to look for a fight. So battle lines are three people here. Akali coming in to dive. Three people here, Aatrox coming in to peel for the front, and Gragas joining bottom side. So Ash is the only person who can't get there. And Tom Kench actually uses Abyssal Voyage alone. Like, the moment this happened, C9 just completely screwed up this play. The reason why I say that is, is that Ash can't get there. And Akali has to all in the moment her teleport comes in. So 
How can this call happen? Tom Kench and Ash are on a reset. Ash goes to mid lane. I'm watching the minimap here because it's way more interesting. Tom Kench is coming to mid lane to make Ash safe. Then the engage party happens, right? And then Tom Kench is like, wait, there's going to be a fight. I have to go and join there. And Tom Kench had already left. The funny thing is, like, when is Abyssal Voyage used? I'm trying to work it out. Abyssal Voyage is used now. It's used before Fake God even teleports. But then it's double popped. So I guess Zazel and Sneaky weren't talking. Because again, it this becomes 100 Thieves getting to focus one person front to back team fight on the back end. And Sneaky not even being able to get there. Like that's awful, awful times. Oh, baby, here we go. Oh, yes. I recognize the start of that clip. Oh, that was sexy. Oh, yeah. So at this point, both assassins are dead and Bang still has ult up. Already, if this is the result, if you see double gray screen on Niski and Licorice and you're Bang, you don't give a fuck about the enemy team. They can do nothing to you. You have QSS, Flash, Featherstorm up. Already, it's impossible for this team to win a team fight. Not even just because of numbers, but because these are the people that stop Bang from doing damage. Like right now, he is actually God. It doesn't matter what items he has. There is no threat that a Jarvan, Ash, or Tom Kench can have on him. So Bang at this point already is like, it's time for me to pop off. Like you have no reservations about like, am I going to be flanked with a EQ? Am I going to need to flash defensively? Everything you have from this point onwards is to clean up a fight. Because if you get more than one more person, you 100% take Baron. So already Bang has like got the swagger he's never had in 2019. And he just flashes 1v3 alone. Instant QSS. Oh, such a sexy QSS. Beautiful. Just delightful. Bang knows you get one more kill there. The Baron is yours. Really nice. I think he can't do anything, right? There's nothing Ash can do next to an Aatrox. I mean, I don't know if he needed to int, though. What is Sneaky going to do here? There's no teleport on Licorice 22 seconds away. 19 second port, second port, teleport. He doesn't have Baron Vision. I mean, like, I don't think you can go for that with no vision of anything. 250 damage volley steal. Like, I don't know about that one. Wait, did he get 700 gold from this? Uh... That was, um, like, I don't know what happened here. Like, Tom Kench and Ash, if they were going to fight, somebody trolled somebody between Tom Kench and Ash because they just didn't commit. It's not like the Tom Kench is, like, flanking into a backline play. If you notice, Zazel Abyssal Voyage is into a place where Ash definitely could have fought with him. Like, that's a defensive Tom Kench spot compared to I'm, like, Inting into the backline style. And yet Ash wasn't there, so they just straight up lost and then bangs a god with his cleanse timing. Beautiful stuff from him. And now the game's over because Cloud9 went for a 1 3 1 comp and then um, fell apart. And like Cloud9 definitely, like they addressed a lot of their issues. I thought they played 1 3 1 Aurelia Akali, I want to say, the next day very cleanly. Um, on day two of LCS. But um, I think their aggressive plays with Blabber showed a lot less prep and setup than when Svenskeren's in the lineup. But what I will say about 100 Thieves is that their 
defensive setups around and just ability to read the map, I think was very, very good. And I think that's the sort of thing that um, Ryu and Amazing on different teams have been smart about is some of their prep stuff and calm stuff. And you're actually feeling every player actually on the ball and, and kind of fake God on a ride, but at least willing to teleport first and having strong mental. So from this point onwards, it's almost impossible for 100 Thieves to ever lose a team fight with this comp. Someone has to instantly pop Bang or Ryu, and it's Seraph's Banshee Veil Victor, the most defensive Victor build I've ever seen, actually, not even overstating it. That's super defensive. You never see Seraphs until recently. I think PoE was the first to go into the Seraphs um, Victor. And, you know, Zaya already showed what kind of mind she's in. Really interesting game. I think C9 can adjust. If a C9 could adjust their 11 to 20, they win this game pretty easily, pre-25, because they had gotten a huge jungle lead. But three wrong team fights and never setting up a flank team fight until it was too late, that final fight where Ash and Tom Kench doesn't come through, um, was too much for them. The build from Sneaky is a really intriguing one. Trinity Force Ash is, is very good for a 40% CDR. Um, my guess is he went this build because the comms from Reaper was around, you know, look, you're not gonna be a, you're not gonna be the damage carrier this game. It's about Akali Silas team fighting. I just want you to have more arrow uptime and, and more utility. I think it's actually perfectly fine. It allows him to kite away from Aatrox with Rage Passive pretty well. But it of course doubly cements that you're never getting back into the game. It's a very non standard build, kinda like the Lethality Ash I've been talking about, but I think with the team comp he has, it actually has a smart role. It just in scenarios like this where you make mistakes, you can't make mistakes and then go Trinity Force Ash because then even if the enemy like dives in one by one like dominoes, you don't have the uh, enough um, damage to kill them. We're not going to talk too much about the specifics of these parts because like C9 at this point is paying for the sins of their team fight mistakes. Like 100 Thieves just have a walking team fight comp that can just walk up and win the game whenever they decide they want to. So we'll mostly play this from here, but um, obviously there's any intricate moments, we'll talk about them. It's probably too late to go for a teleport flank. It's only 3,800 gold lead, but given the comp advantage, it needs to be a god teleport and a person deleted. Otherwise the gold lead overrates, you know, underrates how strong 100 Thieves are. Bang comes back in with now finished five items. Yeah, well played by Amazing to push away there. The minion wave for the final inhibitor. That's no real way to get back into this game. A low, you know, the world's most optimistic licorice flank, perhaps, but... Um, all right, we're going to see the fight. Walking out for the third inhibitor. Credit to Cloud9, they actually do start, try to fight before things are over. Everything's up 400 Thieves, though. So even perfectly here, it's going to be hard. Aphrom, your QSSs. Blabber dies instantly. As Licorice comes in from a flank. But yeah, just Death Ball. Death Ball, kite back. No mechanics to talk about there. Doesn't matter if C9 play perfectly, they still lose the fight. Good stuff from 100 Thieves. Shows how misleading stats can be, because the stats are worse for summer than they are for spring, right? We went over the player breakdowns and we tried to see it. I think realistically, 100 Thieves will likely be found out through top lane, because I think... If Cloud9 plays this perfectly, it never matters that Aatrox is a better team fighter than Akali because you keep snowballing objectives and then Aatrox never gets his items. And I think Fake God's laning phase is very, very poor. Um, there's a hope that it's just kind of stage nerves and the third, fourth, fifth week he's going to be able to perform better. But, you know, he was way down in CS this game um, without there ever being a jungle gank topside which is probably a bad sign. 
Um, and I think outside of that, like it does feel like Ryu in the mid lane, we saw the, the teleport play with the ward that um, caught the Akali top side where Bang and him were on the same net. It, that seems to really be helping their comms. So I think you have to take a loss somewhere. And sadly, someday, you know, a guy who's obviously a beast top laner on his day is forced to the sidelines. But I think even if, like, if you could just upgrade Fake God a little bit, like, find just a NA top laner who's competitive, maybe like Solo, right, from um, the pool of available players, then I think this 100 Thieves roster could actually be pretty decent. Like, they're never going to be... They're always going to have the potential being blown up in the first 15 minutes because I think they are slow movers, and I think the CSD and XP differences show you that a lot of these players' tendencies are defensive. There's no offensive player on this team. Amazing is a defensive jungler. Reuse a defensive mid laner. Bang is a defensive AD carry. And Aframu has had aggressive moments in the past, but I think he, you know, finding back his form is always going to play on the back foot. Um, I think they're very likely to kind of total their way to a mid game. Like it does feel really 100 Thieves comp with this mid lane victor. But if they stabilize, I think they can wake up and be a strong team if they can recreate the comms and the smart um, teleports they showed in this game. So I actually come away from this wanting to watch more 100 Thieves. Um, I think the second round match between 100 Thieves and Cloud9 could actually be really interesting. And then um, for Cloud9, who a team that we've been tracking all the way through, I think Sven Skaren and the roster... I haven't seen this level of bad macro from C9 with Sven in the roster. This is my first Blabber game I'm reviewing on stream. I think I'm not in there for the comms, but they're, they're all in on blue buff was kind of, after they'd already got the Rift Herald, was always kind of symbolic of kind of some of the issues they've had here because they definitely read page one of what Reaper would want them to do this draft. The moment you see the Trinity Force... Uh, Ash, the moment we saw the draft, we're like, aha, it's counter jungling draft. It's a map control draft. But then execution wise, about when to pull the trigger, they seemed really off. So I think that Licorice has been poor this season at spreading his lead and lost some uncharacteristic mistakes in kind of the 1v1s in lane. So I think that. Licorice is still kind of finding his form back on this team while they're trying to do a lot of stuff. So it just doesn't concern me about C9 in the medium to long term at all. I think they're in between play styles and I think they're close to working something because they, they worked the first 10 to 11 minutes here really, really well, but they'll they'll learn a lot. This is a high value VOD review for C9 and, and 100 Thieves is a high value VOD review because they won and they can feel good about how they played and how many times in 2019 can you say 100 Thieves won and they could feel good about how they played? Like, apart from the level one face check, they played this really well. So that's going to be my VOD review for C9 versus 100 Thieves. That's my first VOD review of the night. Going to take a short break and eat some dinner and come back with LCK VOD review. Really hype series. I really hope you join me for King Zone versus Diamond Gaming Game 3. Some awesome plays in that game. And then we finish off the night with LEC later. We'll be the G2 Fanatic uh, Fun Fest, we'll call it, as the final review of the night. So thank you very much for watching game number one. We got to see the This Is Bang moment. We feel good about that. And we'll be back for more VOD reviews in just a bit of time. Thank you very much for watching.